Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is a Ukraine war frontline update for the 15th of June 2023. Let's get to the northeast sector to begin with. Not a huge amount of activity today to be honest up and down a front line including well I say not a lot of activity not a lot of map movement should we say there'll be a lot of activity uh, but it's becoming more positional I think. Anyway let's start in the northeast sector Kupiansk to Svatva, to Kremlin front line. Looks like this on my map. Kupiansk is here. Uh, Kremlin is there and Svatva is there. Okay, so what does the ISW Institute for the Study of War say? Uh, not a great deal on this sector. Uh, Cherovati, Ukrainian spokesperson, says the Russian forces conducted seven ground attacks on Ukrainian positions in the Kupiansk and Liman directions. That is uh, this direction and this direction. In other words, that whole front line. Uh, seven attacks, uh, nothing really to report. Unsuccessful operations near Vesely and Rostolivka, actually. That's north of Bakhmut, so that's really getting down to Bakhmut area. And a Russian mill blogger claimed Russian forces unsuccessfully attempted to advance near Bilohorivka. So that is just to the south of the forest here, just south of Kremina. That's Bilohorivka. Just a reminder that the blue and red lines should now, right up and down the front line, refer to the Russian uh, defensive lines. So this is where the Russians are, not where the Ukrainians are, as according to blue, pro-Ukrainian mapper uh, Andrew Perpetua, red, pro-Russian mapper Syriac maps. I'm not using Deep State Map too much at the moment. They're on a 48 to 72 hour operational security guidance from the Ukrainians. So that so they're, it's not worth using them. I'll use them around Bakhmut and Abdivka to just update their lines I have, which I'll show you later. Thank you very much to JR, who's helping me do some of my mapping now. And indeed, we have a white uh, line to add to the lines we have here uh, that indicates, and if I show it, it indicates where the uh, front line was before the beginning of the counteroffensive. So that's a, a deep state map, May the 30th line. And that'll be useful, particularly for when we get down to the Zaporizhia area, so you can see much more clearly where the Ukrainians have advanced with regard to the 30th of May. But it is a deep state map line, so that may differ anyway from the other mappers I am using. Anyway, I'll just turn it off for now. That just gives you an idea. Right, uh, we'll go down to Bakhmut. So not a lot of activity until we get to Bakhmut. And then we have uh, in this northern area, uh, north of Solodar, north of Bakhmut, is Vesely and Rozdalivka. There is activity going on there. And as we come down, uh, there is Bakivka here and Yahidni just north of the back of Bakhmut city. Uh, the reservoir at Bakivka is not a reservoir full of water. It's a little bit of water to the eastern side, but basically it's dry. The dam was blown some time ago. Uh, right, let's go to the ISW, see what they claim. This is the American military think tank that uh, accumulates the sources from both sides and lets you generally make up your uh, own ideas about what's happening. So they say that, or report that Deputy Defence Minister Hanna Malia has reported Ukrainian forces have advanced between 200 and 500 metres in unspecified areas on the flanks of Bakhmut over the past day. Ukrainian Eastern Group of Forces spokesperson Cherovar noted on June 13th that the intensity of hostilities in the Bakhmut area decreased slightly and reported that regular Russian elements including airborne, so paratrooper units, continued to deploy to the Bakhmut area to take over former Wagner Group positions. Um, that is activity taking place. Uh, well, it doesn't give any specificity as to where those advances are taking place. There is fighting in Bekivka. The Russians are pushing back in Bekivka. They'd had a huge counterattack there that took about three days uh, and it didn't really succeed at all. The Ukrainians have started pushing back, but there are there is elements of, of you know, offensive defense, if you like, from the Russians in that area. There's talk from uh, Kenneth Gregg this morning, the Finnish fighter who's fighting and supporting activities within Ukraine. He was saying from some of his sources that there's activity taking place three kilometers behind the front line, front line in this, uh, I think in this kind of northern area. 
Blahad Datne might be in that 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 area. So three, I again take what he claims with a pinch of salt, but three kilometers would be yeah that puts that kind of area. So there could be groups that have got behind the lines and are, and are active here or somewhere similar. Uh, so there is activity going on. It's just n- operational security is active around Bakhmut as well as it is down in the southern regions in Zaporizhia. The Ukrainians seem to be pushing here as well, uh, near Klishchivka, uh, towards the Russian forces and trying to clear out the area around the canal. The Russians seem to be pushing back, trying to maybe retake the land that they lost over the last week in this area. They lost some tree lines and trench lines there. The Russians seem to be pushing back there. But uh, essentially, yeah, there seem to be gains, gains on both sides, both flanks of Bakhmut City, but no explicit details thereof. No reports says Bakhmut Axis, 80th Brigade is attacking west of Bakivka, as mentioned, and north of the Bakivka Reservoir. So that is to say they could have uh, some purchase to the north here. This is what Andrew Perpetua said the other night. He thinks that, the, that there is some Ukrainian activity there north of the reservoir, and this could explain how they've been attacking uh, Bakivka from the west, as has been acclaimed over the last week. Um, small gains were made directly north of the Bovo Vasilivka. So back on my map, that is here. So there could be some small gains in this area, just north of there. Again, it's fairly slow going in the area. In general, the combat is happening in the blue outlined areas. That's on his map, that looks like that. Uh, so near Zaliznyatsky at the Bova Vasilivka, there were some gains in, in that area to the uh, to the west. In general, the combat is happening in the outlined areas. The forward advance is deeper, but yet... Uh, unclear uh, to map he has much more favorable lines for the russians of uh, well for the ukrainians sorry that that ostensibly look a bit like this uh i think his lines would go something like that um you don't have these two prongs either side of the e40 highway the m03 uh but anyway there's activity taking place there. Whether or not it's reflected accurately on my map is another question. Just to remind you, the yellow here is deep state map, but deep state map are behind 48 to 72 hours due to operational security. So uh, not a lot has has changed there uh, and it doesn't seem to change very currently. So we come down to uh, Avdivka. Uh, Avdivka here, not a great deal of... Uh, activity taking place here we go to the isw it basically says uh the general staff report that russians conducted unsuccessful offensive operations towards abdivka and marienka and that's pretty much that so not a lot really to report kenneth gregg said that it's the only area that he's aware that the uh, you, russians are really pushing trying to push an offensive going on the attack although i think we've got elements of that in in bakhmut but that's kind of as i say off offense is the best form of defense there um but w- whether here that they are trying to be you know genuinely offensive i find them genuinely offensive but that's another thing right then we come down to uh Mari- marienka where there is quite a bit to be mentioned now the there has been a huge amount of activity from the Ukrainians behind Russian lines. So in particularly, as you can imagine, in the Zaporizhia direction and southern Donetsk area, where you've got Mariupol, Berdyansk, Melitopol, Tokmak, Volnovaka, all these places that are getting absolutely hammered, and Primorsk down there, hammered by, um, or is that between Mariupol and Berdyansk? Not sure. Anyway, uh, hammered by HIMARS, hammered by Storm Shadow missiles. There was a, in Primorsk, a coastal holiday resort place that was being used i think by chechen forces and it could be that both a general well not not two people he is both a general and a state duma representative uh may have been killed or wounded there are lots of rumors uh and this and then well up in kremina as well uh, which is in the Kupians to Kremina front line here, there is, or here, Kremina, there was a conglomeration of 200 troops waiting to be uh, to be talked to by a Russian 
general, and he was a general that was in charge of the forces in Vukadar and got given a medal for sending 100 tanks to their death there well uh to the death well he he was given a medal for that and he seems to be operating around kremena now he had 200 troops waiting for him and then those 200 troops were hit by uh, artillery and high mars and there's potentially 100 dead and 100 wounded those are claims by russians themselves that was corroborated by russian claims so that is really serious and unsure about the fate of of that russian uh, general but the chechen forces in marinka there are claims that they've been withdrawn to help up in Kremena with the evacuation there but there's also claims that they have been brought back down to the uh, Primorsk area too so it could be that fighting in Marienka could well be affected by that this is, this is just come out from uh, Dmitry War Translated. It says, Meanwhile, one of the top Chechen warlords, Apti Alaudinov, states on his telegram that all Akhmat units located in Marienka were being withdrawn and transferred to the area of the incident with Adam Delimkanov. Oddly, he uses a lot of emojis while promising to find Delimkanov, regardless of the cost. This is a highly unusual style, and the statement itself is confusing. Russian terrorists under the call sign uh, 13th says that Marienka is effed. Uh, unclear if these messages are related in any way. I I, I think that is pretty important uh, myself. The Akhmat troops, those uh, troops in Marienka who were Chechen fighters, were getting a little cold feet. They didn't like the fighting there by all accounts. Some of the uh, messaging that was coming out of there said that, yeah, it's not like tiktok videos is it so they 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 were under a lot of pressure it's pretty rough in it's a hellscape in marienka so it seems like they have been pulled back to uh primorsk rather than so there's primorsk to the west of berdiansk and that's where that big hit was uh yesterday although there is one other claim saying that they've been pulled up to Kremlin to help with the evacuation as i've mentioned so nonetheless marinka it could there could be some uh, interesting developments there possibly over the next few days uh geolocated isw has geolocated footage posted yesterday that shows russian forces have made incremental advances in western marinka and this is russians getting hit in these positions by ukrainian uh, IEDs and whatnot. Uh, uh, this is in Marinka. So we'll look at where the Russians are and see if that does show an advance as according to our map. Sometimes the ISW is a bit, uh, I'm not sure what they uh, include as, as an incremental advances. This looks like, yeah, it could be. Well, uh, so Suryak Maps has had that under Russian control. Uh, for for a wee while, um, that is not under control as according to Andrew Perpetua's mapping uh, that has this area still under, uh, or at least grey zone. So it could be that Russians have made some incremental advances there, uh, but that is possibly just confirming what was already noted by Syriac maps. Anyway, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward in Marienka if the Chechens have pulled out there uh, and whether this the idea of this Russian uh, mill blogger that, or actually terrorist with a call sign, so is someone operational there, it seems, um, whether the Russians are indeed effed in that area. Uh, okay, let's move on to the south. So as you can see, there's not a huge amount of information coming out. Apparently, there is uh, is more positional fighting going on in the Vukladar area, uh, but it's all really about what's going on on the border between uh, Donetsk and Zaporizhia, the two oblasts there south of uh, Velika Novosilka. There, well, if we look at well, actually, before we go to the maps, let's look at the general lay of the land in terms of tactics and what's going on. So, and I said most of this this morning in my news piece, so apologies for repeating myself. So, this is coming from George Bor Boris, who works for the ISW. Uh, the Russians have been doing pretty well so far. Sorry, Barros, not Boris. Uh, Russians have been pr doing pretty well so far in their defence, engaging in tactically sound defence at the local level because some of their more competent generals have been assigned to the front lines in the south of Ukraine. Uh, so some of their decent troops and generals are there uh, anticipating, I guess, the counteroffensive. 
and doing quite a good job of defending, which is kind of what you would expect, right? I think we've got these false ideas, some of us maybe, that Russia would just... Ukraine would punch through the Russian defences really quickly and they would crumble away. But my claims are that actually those defences are going to be really challenging, the minefields particularly, uh, the trenches and so on, that it will be slow going until they can punch through, find a weakness somewhere, punch through and then exploit that. However, there's an element of are they using this as a, as an opportunity to attrit the you, the Russian forces as they were doing in Bakhmut. So I really think this is part of Ukraine's plan. They needed to fix the reserves before their main thrust. Russia was forced to send reserves to the area, which is exactly what Ukraine wanted. The main thrust will come somewhere else. In fact, we haven't really seen activity in many other places. So yes, there's some activity in Veliko Novosilka, a little bit in south of Hlyopole, a little bit south or quite a bit south of Orokiv and towards Kamianska. So yes, it dotted around this area, but no, no additional forces in the Vukhladar area, no additional forces Avdivka, Bakhmut, uh, Liman, uh, Sversk area, Liman area, and then up towards Fatou and Kupiansk. There's no additional forces there. So this is actually very limited. And it, it could this be the case that they are actually drawing the Russian forces to panic into defense and then chew them up? Well, this is what is is thought of by by some some people here. So, uh, this chap says Ukraine war update. The goal is destruction of the Russian army. Ukraine is drawing out their reserves and chewing them up. The plan is working well. Taking geographic locations is a secondary effect. It will come when the time is right. The main breakthrough attack is still not obvious, nor will it be until the conditions are right. Every Russian soldier, or vehicle, or system taken out is one less than can uh, can be used. Uh, at the critical moment when the stakes are greatest, a brutal strategy necessary when fighting the Russian army. Uh, and and then you hear this from Deputy Defence Malia, which has also been contradicted by the general um, general staff. So it's very difficult for the soldiers of the armed forces to counterattack because the Russians have densely mined the fields. I think I think that is absolutely true. They are actively resisting, true, and are advancing themselves in several directions. So there are these counterattacks. They've counterattacked in um Makarivka. So if we zoom in to the Velika Novosilka, we have Makarivka being uh, under Ukrainian control, then the, the Russians supposedly counterattacked. There were varying claims as to whether they actually retook it, but they tried to retake it a number of times. And then the Ukrainians have pushed them back and now are, I think, pretty much definitely in control of that. But the Russians are pushing back hard. And that, I don't know whether the Ukrainians were expecting that or whether they're adapting to that and thinking this is a good opportunity to attrit their forces, attrit their reserves. And if they chew up all the equipment and reserves here, and Andrew Perpetua has mapped on his map a number of destroyed vehicles, like quite a, quite a large number of them in this area, then they are chewing up the Russian uh, equipment and troops before them being able to have a more effective counterattack. But the minefields are very difficult. They have to negotiate the minefields, go through villages that are booby-trapped, that have mines. It's just slow going. It's not going to be a lightning counter-offensive like we saw in Kharkiv last year. Trent Tolenko, uh, you know, you, the Euromaidan press here says uh, that Russian troops have been forced to conduct strictly defensive operations now. So they're now claiming they've gone back to a more defensive position along the entire southern front line. And that's according to general staff, which isn't quite what Hannah Malia said, uh, but it could be slightly different timings on those statements. Trent Tulenko says uh, that's good. Uh, the Russian only attack or counterattack when they have artillery superiority. And this means that Ukrainian fires have blunted both the the Russian reserves and their artillery. So if they're going to the defensive positioning, it means they don't have the artillery to support an offensive. And there's been an absolute ton of footage to suggest that artillery has been really explicitly targeted in the areas. And something else to support that is Reuters has been given. Reuters went to Storozhevne, Neve, in particular the road which is shown in the footage of June the 12th, quote, the road is littered with Russian corpses and knocked out Russian armoured vehicles, Reuters commented on the released footage. So I, I couldn't quite work out whether they do actually have a reporter in Storage Neve. I mean, that is really close to the front line. Uh, and that'd be fairly surprising having a reporter there in a, in a town they've only just taken. But 
Uh, nonetheless, that is some corroboration that the Ukrainians are taking, you know, big casualties in the area. We've seen quite a bit of footage of captured Russian pieces of uh, equipment. Here's a self-propelled howitzer. So I've seen stuff being towed off down the road, uh, MR2Bs and so on and so forth. So they are losing a lot of equipment. And here's a Ukrainian showing a bunch of equipment that they've captured in, in a hall here. It also goes to show that some of that equipment's half decent. So this indicates that some of the troops in the area might be some of the better Russian troops. Now, I've seen this reported from both sides. Uh, I've seen someone report this as, as pro-Russian. This is the Russian videoing this, showing that they've taken out Ukrainian tanks. But I've seen this reported as this is a Ukrainian filming this as a Russian position is taken, but that they lost that tank. Uh, and that tank was uh, had, had um, ERA on it. So I think that tank is, I think, re reparable. You can see there the ERA's probably done partly its job. But there is indeed damage to the turret. So, but I imagine that's probably quite reparable. There are no, there's no track damage, I don't think, to it. Uh, this is a Ukrainian Leopard tank in the area that has been stuck. That will be recoverable. So the Ukrainians will be losing stuff, but it's whether it's it's lost for good uh, or you know really ki killed, you, you know, taken out. I forget what the term is uh, in terms of the dis destruction of equipment and. Um, you can measure it in levels of destruction and whether it's reparable or not. Um, right, okay, let's actually now look at some of these places in more granular detail. This is the latest report coming out from No Reports. A Ukrainian soldier with a call sign Osman from the 24th Battalion Idar gives a situational update. In Bakhmut, there's an advance and the Russian prisoners were taken. By the way, I've seen so much footage of Russian prisoners taken from the southern uh, front so there is a there are definitely some russian losses in terms of of pow's as well as deaths uh Adivka, no changes zaporizhia there is an advance but no details can be given yet near Vukhodar, as in velika novosilka there are battles for makarivka which are gradually moving to the stage of positional battles so i think this is kind of done yet so that's not included in zaporizhia so there are advances in zaporizhia would be going to the west uh, maybe in the malatok machka area where they struggled and lost that equipment south of uh, um, or Akiv, there's talk about uh, Novo. Uh, where is it? I think it's is it the Novo Andrivka? No, it is Novo Poprovka area and a Novo uh, Novo Dalivka area, maybe around there. So I think there is uh, Novo and Dalivka in this area here. That could be where the Ukrainian advances are. Um, if we look at uh, so yeah, positional battles taking place in a, a Veliko Novoselka. If we look at the war map, a map that's kind of what I've been talking about. Main activity seems to be taking place in Veliko Novoselka, but also just south of Orokiv, near those places I was talking about, and Lobkove still under Ukrainian control. Uh, nothing seems to have come out of that area for the last uh, 24 hours. When you look at the maps, like Pule Volon has this map, and it looks like the Ukrainians have lost a load of territory to the Russians. But this is readjustment. And again, this is what happened yesterday. I'm 100% sure now that uh, Pule Volon mainly uses Andrew Perpetua as his, as his mapping source, as, as do I. I, use, I rely a lot on Andrew Perpetua as well. Um, and he realigned his maps exactly like that. Yesterday, this I mean this morning, I adapted mine. So I actually pulled the Russian line much further forward and actually in line with, and this is how I know it's not a Russian attack, is because it's in line with what Syriac Maps already had. So this is where Syriac Maps had the line uh, from earlier in, in, in the week and Andrew Perpetua had the Russians push back to here. Then yesterday he adapted it to here and then today it's adapted to there. And Syriac Maps hasn't changed their maps for two days now. So it's just, I think the, the mappers are just aligning with each other as information comes through and you can confirm things and you might think, uh, you might have thought that advances were much more than they actually were, but it takes a couple of days for the confirmation uh, of that or the disconfirmation of that to come through. Uh, but there is some claims of Ukrainian gains uh, over here towards or just south of uh, Oliska um, towards Nova, Novoslatopil. 
Uh, there's a lot of talk about activity around Rivnapil. So the Russians are under a lot of pressure there. Ukrainians obviously quite want to take that. That gives them then the ability to go along the high ground here. As you can see, the contours are steeper there as it goes down into this sort of river valley area. The, the Ukrainians really want this high ground so they can pressure these towns from, from the high ground to the west. But that relies on them taking Rivnapil, and that's been quite... A challenge for them so far. Uh, just a little more, bit more detail from no reports. Uh, AFU has fortified positions in Makarivka preparing. Uh, the last two days, the Ukrainians have cleared a lot of mines near Levedny in the blue outlined area. So this is what I'm talking about, how it just is really slow because they've got to clear mines. So it's safe for them to move around, safe for their troops. That takes time and it's slow. Uh, Russians pulled up defense west of Makarivka to protect Rivnapil. That's what I was talking to you about. So that's to say, we go to the Pule Volon map because that's the one we we're just using. That's to say the Russians are uh, defending from this di direction so that they can uh, stop the Ukrainians coming from three directions on Rivnapil. Uh, they're defending by, it seems, attacking through and trying to take uh, Makarivka there. Um, and then... Uh, Noel reports finishes off with uh, Eurozhine is contested so that's further to the south so if we look on my map here uh, and come in we have these two uh, possibly contested I've got them in behind Russian lines for, as according to both mappers now uh, yes they had these being contested Noel report says that they are still contested anyway it's going to be fairly dynamic stuff is happening uh, it's tough for the Ukrainians because they are also getting attacked by KO-52 helicopters. We know that they've lost one, possibly two in the last two days, uh, the helicopters, which is obviously a, a big loss. But then they've just taken 20 down to Berdyansk to help with the fighting in the area, uh, 20 helicopters of, of differing types. So still from a new video published by the Russian MD showing a KO-52 taking out a moving armored vehicle with an anti-tank guided missile, uh, so on and so forth. So it's about eight kilometers away. Uh, you can imagine there being, you know, uh, Ukrainian vehicles operating here and eight kilometers is something like that. So that means it's out, out of range of normal ATGMs, like man pads, sorry, not ATGMs, uh, out of range of uh, man portable air defense systems like stingers and so therefore you're going to have to rely on your more robust air defense systems uh, that might be in place but themselves are also uh, potentially victim to lancets and other kind of drones and i've just seen some footage now in fact i'll grab that for you this is one of the last things i'll say because there isn't too much information to give elsewise so this is footage, and I presume it's from the south, but it might not be. But I, my presumption it's from the south. This is footage of uh, Durant, so Shahid drones being used in the daytime offensively by the looks of it on the front line. I think this is two separate videos. Uh, of two separate Shahids being used, but it might not, it might be the same Shahid. I don't know. But but anyway, they managed to shoot them both down or one down. Uh, as you can see, these running now, is, I presume it's, it's coming down. You can see it come down and then it explodes uh, just by nearby. There you go. And they're pretty happy with that. And then there's another... Bit of footage of another one but i don't know as i said i don't know if it's the same one and it comes down it could well be the same one um and explodes there so uh they are using shaheeds now uh on the front line so they are throwing quite a lot at this obviously as you'd expect they're defending uh their positions uh, but the, but they do have an aerial advantage i think in terms of helicopter, in terms of fixing an aircraft, uh, and if they're starting to use these drones in this way, then perhaps that might give them some some other kind of edge as well. I don't know, but it, it's going to be difficult. But this is what you'd expect. This is this is uh, counteroffensive. This is war. Um, 
activity therefore so just to summarize there is still ongoing activity that doesn't look that different from yesterday there's maybe marginal gains for the ukrainians uh in this area uh around levadne and just to the uh to the west to the east of there uh the ukrainians are trying to really uh, put a lot of pressure on taking on rivnapil and take rivnapil uh perhaps uh further down south some of these are contested um, and then we come to the West and there's not a lot of information coming out, uh, but there could be some gains in this area as well. It sounds like uh, Nova Pokrovka uh, is, is um, in fact, I haven't gone to the ISW, uh, which pretty much says all of this. Uh, Malia has said that they've made 300, 350 metres gain in, in Zaporizhia direction. Of course, that's not very specific in terms of where, but and it's also not a huge gain. But again, is that what you expect of this kind of fighting? Uh, a lot of talk about Makarivka. It's gelicated footage published yesterday that shows it's definitely controlled by the Ukrainians. Uh, ISW continues to assess that Russian forces are defending the Western Donetsk Oblast area in accord with the Russian tactical defense doctrine, which calls for a first echelon of defense forces to repel a slow attacking forces, while a second echelon of forces counterattacks against an enemy breakthrough. Uh, and then it goes on to say Ukrainian forces continue to fight Russian forces near Nova Andilivka and Nova Pokrovka. That's what I was just talking about. Russian mill bloggers claim that Ukrainian forces unsuccessfully conducted limited assaults near Orykiv. And are continuing reconnaissance in force operations, so not huge operations. And then it talks about helicopters and the helicopters being sent, uh, as I gave you satellite imagery yesterday, to Berdyansk. And of course, they are being brought to bear uh, in this um, theatre as well. So Berdyansk just down here, that's where they are. They have their a lot of helicopters parked, and they're going to be using them on the front line um, to help with their defence there. So that's a summary. Uh, Little, not a great amount of detail, but uh, there is an awful lot of footage of equipment being destroyed, particularly Russian equipment being destroyed, and a lot of Russian POWs being taken, and reports of quite a lot of Russian losses. Uh, the general staff say it's at 5.3 ratio of Russian losses to uh, Ukrainian losses, 5.3 to 1. So they are claiming that they are. this is really attritional and much more so for, for the Russians. Uh, but of course, you know, that is coming from the Ukrainians. Anyway, uh, thank you for hanging out here and watching that. Please take care. Uh, I hope this has been useful. Please like, subscribe and share and I'll speak to you later.